This... This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. Uh, today I want to talk about an issue that's been coming up a lot in discussions in the last couple of months, and that is the media and the question of why is, why is the modern media so terrible? And when I, when I say media, I think most people know what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about um, online news sources and newspapers and magazines and, um, you know, CNN and Fox News and, and all the different stations, right? And so I think that, you know, more and more uh, on a range of different issues, but just the recent one being this Cuomo thing, uh, so many of us have been talking about just how how terrible the media is, and it feels like it feels like it's definitely gotten worse and it's getting worse. And I don't think we're imagining that. So I want to get into this today from um, from a really a, a more unusual or a deeper philosophical uh, perspective. And as you know, I like to mix in a little bit of uh, psychology and philosophy and even theology occasionally in, into my videos. But in this one, I actually wanted to take some time and talk about what to me is one of the most um, fascinating you know, theories about that, that really just explains so well this feeling that we have that there is something not only that's really wrong with our media culture, and, but also that it's getting worse. It's very almost like an ominous feeling. And so I want to talk about this philosopher. So his name is uh, Jean Baudrillard, a French guy. Uh, he is, he's dead. I think he died in like 2005. Uh, I'm not sure, but you can look it up. But he was really a, a French philosopher, really well known, uh, and, and especially was, was very famous in intellectual circles in, um, in the, the 90s and the early 2000s. And I'm not going to do like a typical lecture thing where I go through all of his theories and I tell you about his background and all of that. I just want to get to what I think is really interesting because if, if you'll just hold on with me for, for a second while I do something a little different, I think that you'll, you'll really find this rewarding because it is something that is so on all of our minds, all right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, let me just start by saying, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, The Matrix before, but... Uh, the Matrix actually is loosely uh, inspired by uh, the theories of Jean Baudrillard. In fact, in the film, there's a character who is actually has a book by Baudrillard. Uh, and so, if you've seen The Matrix, though, or, or even if you haven't, right, the basic premise is that people, all of humanity, is stuck in a program, right, and Everyone kind of and and everyone kind of senses that there's something wrong, but most people don't really know it. I can't really accept it, or much less have any idea of what's going on. And it turns out all of humanity is in this computer program, is is hooked into a, a kind of a psychological virtual reality program, because in real life, in the non-virtual world, their unconscious bodies are being uh, stripped of energy that this alien race needs. Okay, so that's the plot. But here's the thing. Everybody in this movie is hooked into this this matrix, right? All of life is a, is a simulation, a video game in a way. And there are characters who sense that there's something wrong with this. And in fact, there's this really famous speech in The Matrix when um, the main character, Keanu Reeves' character, is confronted for the first time about this. And it's explained to him for the first time. He first learns about it. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. 
Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This... This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. And, uh, and that's an interesting speech, because the guy says you feel it all around you. You know, you know that it's there. You know that it's alien. It's not, it's not natural. It's not right. It's, it bothers you, but you just, you just don't know what it is. And I think that increasingly we, we can think about our, that is, that is a very good representation of our modern media age. And when I talk about media, I'm going to be talking about it in the expanded sense uh, now of not just thinking about like news, but thinking about any form of media. So we're talking about, you know, computers, movies, Facebook, video games, porn, um, you know, everything under the sun. OK. And so uh, that's, you know, the, the term media, it it if you think about what a uh, media a mediation is, like if you have two people who are wanting to divorce. Right. And they can go through mediation. Well, the mediator is one who stands between two things. So media, if we get back to its root, right, what the term media means is it is this thing which connects but also stands between us and the real world, us and reality. So this is the interesting, this is one of the interesting things that Baudrillard was interested in. So Baudrillard had a, a number of ideas that I, I'm not familiar with and I, I don't, or I don't care for, especially when it comes to some of his um, economic political ideas, but he's so brilliant when it comes, when it came to diagnosing and he diagnosed this back in the, in the eighties, right? And wrote about it in the eighties and the nineties. Uh, but diagnosing the, that one of the significant problems with our society would increasingly be our very conflicted uh, relationship to media. And Baudrillard, uh, he had this, and you know, this is this was back. He was thinking about this stuff, you know, back in the the eighties and the nineties when you when we didn't have the internet, uh, we didn't have really cell phones, or they weren't widely used you know, no GPS, no iPhone. I mean, those of you who remember living during this time, and I do, it was, it was looking back on it now, we can say nostalgically that it was, it was kind of a magical time in that way. Even though, yeah, you didn't have GPS. And so you had to, if you're going to go on a trip, you had to like get the map out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but Baudrillard, even writing back then, uh, he recognized that as awesome as the explosion and proliferation of media uh, and all this media technology would be, it would bring with it a tremendous sense of alienation from our humanity and from the natural world or what we like to refer to as the real world. And so if we think about the idea of media as that which mediates but also stands between, um, think of all of the ways in which our natural experience of the world, one that has evolved, you know, over uh, many, 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 many years, right, biologically speaking, if you look at human evolution, you know, millions of years. Um, and only recently, so you see that long, long period of evolution, right, where there's very slow change. You know, it, let me explain it this way. If you were to chart out the technical evolution of humankind, and so you were to go back to like, you know, the uh, cave, cavemen and women and, you know, then getting the Stone Age and then getting into, you know, civilizations like ancient Egypt, thousands of years later and that sort of thing. What you would see is that technological advancement remained relatively flat, relatively stagnant, really until the 19th century. In other words, you could look at the way that a cave, <laughs> uh, I guess it doesn't matter. You could look at the way that a caveman or woman was living and it really, in terms of the technology, it wouldn't be that different from the way that your average uh, citizen in ancient Rome was living. 
And that wouldn't really be that different technologically from the way that someone in, you know, medieval uh, Europe would be living. And so, yes, of course, there were technological advancements along the way. But what you see is when you get to the 19th century, and so you have, you know, things like um, you know, the steam engine and uh, uh, cotton, cotton gin and various things, and the telegraph uh, toward the, in the later part, uh, and, you know, and then turn of the century and you have the light bulb. And then we get to the 20th century, as you know, then we've got television and we've got uh, cars and, you know, planes and all kinds of things. But here's what's interesting. Relatively flat, right? Relatively flat, and then starting somewhat in the 19th century, but then in the 20th century, and now where we are, just, just parabolic, okay? Uh, and so what this is, and a number of people have written about this, you know, philosophers and scientists and so forth, is that we're seeing a kind of an inflection point in human evolution. In other words, it's kind of like if you've ever seen that movie, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where you've got the, you know, the early human, the ape-like creature, and then it has this transition into using tools, and it's this big moment of like, it's like a leap forward when we started using tools. Well, when you think about the, the dramatic existential changes that technology uh, is causing, has been causing, and is increasingly causing, and the fact that, tech, that we're at a point now where technological innovation is now becoming exponential. In other words, if you look at that graph, you know, of development over time, and we go back to the people living in the caves, and then we chart it, right, for so, 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 so long, it's just slight increases, and then we get to where basically we are now, and it's like, and so we are changing into something, you know, that, that philosophers have referred to as the techno-human, that which is not just human, but that which is also technological. And we're, I don't, and I don't even have to describe it, like we're all aware of all of the ways in which our, or many of the ways in which our natural experience of our lives, you know, are distorted by media. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll try to tell uh, younger, younger friends of mine about what it was like to be to grow up in the 80s and be a teenager in the 90s and how, yeah, even though we had stuff like TV and, and things, just the mere fact that we didn't have cell phones, that if someone wanted to contact you, then they would have to try to get a hold of you on your landline. And, you know, before people got answering machines, then it was like it was really a crapshoot, right, <laughs> as to whether you were going to be able to talk to somebody. And you might say, well, that sucks, but it was so freeing because there was a time and a place where you would use the phone and then you were free from it the rest of the time. And there was a time and a place when people could get a hold of you and then you were free the rest of the time. And when you did have communication, it was more natural, right? It wasn't a lot of this text or this sort of frenetic stuff where we're just always hooked up to things. You know, I don't know if you feel this way or not. I've talked about this. I've talked with some of my friends about this. But I feel like now it's reached a point where I am so inundated daily with different forms of media and technology, whether it's, and it's not like it's forced on me, right? I'm not saying that, but you know, whether it's, it's Twitter or Netflix or it's not just Netflix, right? Now we have like a hundred different movie channels to choose from. And anyway, my, and the cell phone and email and all of that. And my point being, um, that I feel like I am just now existentially just caught up in a kind of tornado of media, <laughs> And it feels like, like I, some, I want to be able to stop and catch my breath. And, and I don't know if you have that feeling or not. But this is very much what, um, you know, this is, this is an issue because biologically we have these, these systems that are calibrated to evolve very slowly. And then you take that and you interject into it this, this exponential technological capacity. And so we see our tech, increasingly we want to see our technological capability outstripping our evolution, our natural or biological, you know, psychological evolution. Now I'm not trying to be like a Luddite and I'm not saying like, oh, we shouldn't have technology or I don't really have an answer. I'm not trying to promote anything. That's not, you know, that's not what this video is about. I just kind of wanted to talk about it because it's something that's been on my mind and I think it's interesting. And so this Baudrillard guy, he was really interested in this idea, the ways in which media distort, and again, using that more general sense of the term, but media, that media distorts our natural experience of our lives. At the same time 
that it purports to give us an experience that is better than reality. Okay, so you know, he ha Baudrillard uh, came up with this term, or he he coined this particular usage of this term, uh, the hyperreal. And the hyperreal is what he described as this increasing media reality, where on the one hand, it 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 gives you something that purports to be real and is in a way real, and yet because of the of, because of media. It's, it's not natural, it's distorted, and it's hyper-real. It's more real than real, it's amplified. It's amped up, okay? And so let me give you a couple, uh, so that reality is distorted, even while the whole time it's purporting to be, to give you a real experience. So, you know, just a couple of examples. I like to use uh, one of them, internet porn, <laughs> which, um, you know, if you think about it, yes, it's, it's people who are really having sex. They're not simulating it, like in a movie. And yet at the same time, you know, from my <laughs> limited uh, experience or exposure to it, it's not, it's just not my thing, but, you know, we know that it's, it's clear to see and we know that it's often extremely artificial and not, generally speaking, like how, you know, normal people are having uh, sex. <laughs> so, and I'm not judging the porn or I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to be prudish or anything. I'm, this is not about, I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about... Uh, this notion of the hyper-real in media and technology, where on the one hand, it's giving you something that's real, right? So here, watch this porn. You can see these two people really having sex. And at the same time, it's distorted. It's, it's more real than real. And in that way, it causes a kind of a, a cognitive dissonance or discordance that maybe we're not even uh, fully aware of. And so, uh, you know, that's one example. Another example is reality TV. Um, you know, you think of something like The Bachelor and it purports to give you a real scenario, right? Like you're gonna, you know, the, uh, you're gonna watch real conversations and you're gonna see people, you know, really fall in love or <laughs> whatever. And I know a couple of people have actually fallen in love on that show, so that's kind of interesting. They're still together. But my point is, uh, it's purporting to give you this real experience, and yet, of course, we know that reality TV is usually not at all real, that it's either heavily scripted it's, it's heavily scripted. I don't know how much, to what degree they, they improvise on the dialogue. It probably depends on the show and the situation. But they're heavily scripted. And so when you watch The Real Housewives of Orange County, like I hate to say it, but you're not, it's not authentic reality. And yet it is supposed to be more real than real. Like you want to watch this so you, see, so you can see women acting in ways that women don't normally act, right? So, you know, you in your normal life, you probably don't get into screaming fights with your girlfriends where you, you know, throw a glass of champagne at them or something. But you can watch this and you can see something that's better than reality or it's more interesting or whatever, even if it's kind of shallow. And so Baudrillard understood that this would be, as, as media and technology proliferated and would grow exponentially and become more and more sophisticated, Baudrillard foresaw how increasingly the world would become one of, of simulation and one of the hyper-real. Um, now, there's another thing that's, that's interesting that Baudrillard, um, another idea of Baudrillard's. All right, so... Um, Bear with me for just a second, okay? This, this, it's, it's interesting. You stick with me. Um, in philosophy, there is a, a, basically a subgenre of philosophy where people are interested in studying um, semiotics, uh, symbols, language, okay? And, and you know, it's, it's basically a type of linguistics. But in, in philosophy, people are, uh, traditionally speaking, philosophers have been interested in the difference between a symbol of something, okay, versus the thing itself, all right? And so, for instance, like if you have um, a circle, well, there's the thing, the actual thing itself, right, which is a real thing, or it could be a concept, but it is an actual concept of a, of a circle. <laughs> but then there is the, there's the, the word circle and the letters and everything, okay? So in, in this kind of philosophy, uh, you have a difference between what is known as the signifier, and the signifier is the symbol or the representation or the words, okay? There's the signifier, and then there is the signified, and the signified is the actual thing in itself that you're talking about. So it's the actual circle or the actual concept of the circle, all right? Now, 
Traditionally speaking, uh, for, you know, thousands of years, whatever, um, human society, according to this philosophy, human society has, and humans have tended to privilege or to prefer the signified, that is, the thing in of itself, the real thing, versus the signifier. In other words, people have, have always understood that the real thing is what's important and also that the real thing is always more complicated uh, and more, yeah, more complicated and, and trickier to understand and, and a deeper than just what the mere signifier tells us. Okay, and let me give you an example of that, not to wade into the gender debate or anything like that, but it's, this is just a good example. If you think about like a typical uh, women's bathroom, what usually, what is the signifier that they normally put on the bathroom so that you know it's the women's bathroom? Well, it's typically a woman in a dress and with, you know, longer feminine hair. Not always, but typically it is. Now, I'm totally not saying there's anything wrong with that, right? But the point that someone interested in this, the, these questions in philosophy would make is that the signifier is actually, and that could be very inaccurate because maybe most women are not wearing dresses or maybe a lot of women don't have longer hair. And so in that case, the signifier, which is the image of the woman that's on the, the restroom, or it could be the word woman, it is, does not have the, the depth uh, or the complexity to encompass like an actual human being. All right, now you might say, well, this is, this is really obvious. Where are you going with this? Well, this is what's interesting, is that Baudrillard came along and again with his media critique and, and trying to think about what this shift uh, increase in media would mean for, for humanity. And he said that increasingly what was happening was that society was no longer, people were no longer privileging or preferring or recognizing the greater value of the signified, the thing in and of itself that instead, in our increasingly media-driven age with, you know, slogans and commercials and, you know, sensational media and all kinds of stuff, that we would come to value, that we were increasingly coming to value the signifier, that is, the slogan or the words or the, the catchy commercial or the catchy soundbite or whatever. We were, we were increasingly valuing the media signifier, okay? more than the actual signified, okay? And so, and we see this, right? We see this in the evolution of, of all kinds of institutions, and we see it in the complaints that a lot of people have about politici uh, politicians and politics, um, and that it's too slogan-oriented, and people complain about, you know, Twitter culture with hashtags and stuff. And also people complain a lot about the way that things like, you know, uh, movies and TV and commercials and stuff give us sort of... Um, one-dimensional or too easy views of the world, right? Or too sensational views of the world or whatever. Now here is where, hold on, here's where it gets even, even spookier, or to me. I don't know, maybe I'm just a nerd, but <laughs> I love making these connections. This is what really kind of blew my mind, okay? Is that the third stage, and you could argue, you know, Baudrillard predicted that this third stage would, would come quickly. And you could argue that, uh, you know, we're already in this third stage. And I think we are. But Baudrillard said that the final stage in this evolution uh, of the distortion of media and, and the final stage, that the signifier would completely, would not just take precedence, but that it would completely bump the signified out of the way so that there would no longer be really any connection to the underlying truth. And we would find ourselves increasingly in, a, in this media saturated age, we would find ourselves increasingly afloat among just signifiers, right? Things completely detached from their referent from underlying truth. And what Baudrillard thought was so interesting, too, is the way that this tendency would combine with the virality of media, which is, you know, the, just what the term implies, but, the, you know, the capacity of media to proliferate and to copy and to spread, and that that would then enable these signifiers to replicate quickly. So not only do you have the detachment of the signifier from the signified and then the signifier bumping the, the real thing out of the way, 
but now you have the signifier able to be replicated many, many times over. And so we are in a, a wash in a, a sea of bullshit. Uh, so, you know, think about that. There, there, I, I want to have some other things I want to talk about in relation to that. And I kind of want to do this as a series where like every, maybe every third or fourth video I do, uh, I, I make it a, about philosophy or a particular philosophy or a particular idea. So I want to talk more, and I, I will probably in a few weeks, I want to talk more about media and about what, uh, what it's done and doing to our, our culture, both good and bad, from a philosophical and, and also from a psychoanalytic and Freudian perspective. Because as you probably know from my other videos, I really uh, love psychoanalysis and love Freud. Now, there's also a story that uh, another philosopher, I should say, that The Matrix is loosely based on. And again, a number of you who are Matrix fans, you, you might know this. But uh, it's, it's also loosely based on the story The Cave, which is an old story by the classical um, philosopher Socrates. And, um, well, rather, it's, uh, it's written by Plato, but it's attributed to Socrates, which is a whole other story I won't bore you with at this moment. Um, but Socrates, supposedly, tells this story, and this is the story. He describes how there's this cave, and, and the name of the story is The Cave. So Socrates says, there's this cave, and he, he asks the, um, his, his uh, friends to consider, to imagine, that trapped in this cave, tied up, are several men who, for whatever inexplicable reason, have always been tied up there in the cave and have never been outside the cave, have never seen anything outside the cave, don't know anything, um, don't know that anything out exists outside the cave. Now, you know, I know you have to suspend your logic and everything on this, but just go with it, okay? It's a metaphor. So these guys are all chained up, and not only are they chained up, but they're facing um, one of the cave walls, and there is a fire, for whatever reason, someone has, start, has, has started a fire, and there's a fire that's been burning there, and someone, for whatever reason, decides that they're, while these guys are tied up, they're going to make, they're going to stand behind them and make these hand puppets uh, in the, the light of the fire, and what that means is that these guys, they're, they're, they're tied up, they're looking at this wall, and all they see are these images that are made, these shadows that are made on the wall by these hand puppets. Now, as unlikely and weird a scenario as this is, here's the point. Socrates says that they, having never known anything else, they mistake the, uh, the, the puppet uh, figures for real things. They think that that's reality. They don't realize that what they're looking at is it is an illusion. It's a shadow. And then Baudrillard says that at one point one of them escapes and goes outside and realizes then that this whole thing that they've lived their whole lives with is an illusion. And he runs back to tell them because he wants to liberate them. He wants to tell them this is an illusion, right? This is not reality. And what do you think their response is? They're, they're pissed. They're, they're angry. Uh, and they're disdainful and they tell him, you don't know what you're talking about. You're ridiculous. And so there's several morals of the story there. One of them is that, you know, people are generally not uh, receptive to truth uh, or not appreciative of truth until they're, they're ready for it or receptive to it. Um, and also uh, that our lives have, uh, and this is what uh, Plato uh, and the Platonist believed, but that uh, our lives had a real material quality, but also a kind of a spiritual quality. But what I think is really interesting about that metaphor is it also gets into the nature of perception versus reality. And so the reason why that was such an inspiration, that story was such an inspiration for The Matrix, was the, this notion that increasingly in this increasing technological world where every aspect of our lives would be plugged into um, technology in some way, that we would grow to, 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 to see the fake world of technology as the real world. That just like those men staring at the shadows on the wall and thinking that that was reality, that we too, in this increasingly technological world, we, we mistake reality um, for, uh, we mistake false reality for the real one. And so a number of us, the reason why I thought about all this is that a number of us have been talking online and I've been talking in my videos about how I feel like the media, and this is not any great profound thought, but I feel like the news media 
and a lot of the media in general, social media, that out of it's out of control in terms of uh, just spreading stories, no matter how incredible they are. Or in the case of the Cuomo allegations, I mean, as we've as I've talked about in my other video, uh, there's just there's just allegation after allegation where it's the word sexual assault and stuff. It's getting like an harassment. It's getting thrown around in the article. But when you actually read like the description of what he's accused of doing. So many of these allegations, it's nothing. It's like he put his hand on my back at a party or he called me sweetheart. And look, I know you can go look at my, my video on this topic if you want to get into that. But my point is that we all, no matter what you think about Cuomo, the Cuomo situation or your politics or what have you, just like those characters in The Matrix, we all have the feeling, I think, that something is wrong, that something is distorted. But we don't realize that the, the real significance and extent of the historical moment that we're in right now. And I don't say that again because I think that there's something that we should, like, we should be, you know, destroying our computers or anything. I, but what Baudrillard is getting at is that one should not be in denial about the reality of what one is doing to oneself and one's brain and one's development you know, psychologically and what have you, what they're, what, what effect media is having on that. And, you know, we should be careful to be aware of both the positive and the negative consequences so that as we um, grow and develop in our lives, that we can try in a number of ways to resist losing the truth as much as possible or losing ourselves to the false media representation. You know, and it's true that we are in a situation increasingly when we are just in a uh, in a sea of signifiers, and it seems like it seems like there's just so much like sensational lies and bombast and and just just a lot of bullshit, right? And that was the situation, the condition that Baudrillard was describing. And so, if we can be aware of that, I don't know. Maybe we can start to look for ways to resist it or fight it in our own lives. But I don't even really have a point. But I just think that that was really, I thought it was really interesting, and that's something that I've been thinking about the last few days. So, uh, I hope you enjoy this video, and I will have a, a really cool video coming out after this that's unrelated, but I do want to get back to this stuff at some point, especially if you get something out of it. Please leave comments about it, any any thoughts that you have or any ideas that you'd like for me to cover. Um, you know, it could be any kind of meaning of life thing or any kind of philosophical or psychological topic, that, and I will try to get to those every few videos. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, as always, like and subscribe, and I always appreciate tips, PayPal, uh, or Patreon. And okay, have a good night.